Hi, everyone, and welcome back to track one, Owning Your Future with a Rare Disease, for our final, can't believe it, final break out of the event. We hope you all had a great break and enjoyed these last couple days at Global Gene Summit. My name is Carol Dutch. I'm with Lumos Pharma, and I'll be your host today for today's session on finding answers, the importance of communicating with clinicians. This track is being live streamed, and I would like to welcome our remote attendees and remind everyone that you can use the live Q&A feature. So many of us know the challenges in receiving a diagnosis due to misdiagnosis or lack of knowledge around rare disease, but it is important to advocate for yourself and to talk to your healthcare team and ensure you can get help and answers. That's what we're gonna be talking about now. Today with us to share their expertise and knowledge is Caroline Chung, patient advocate and founder of San Diego Undiagnosed Family Support Group, Tiffany Cook, director at Cure Duchenne Cares, and Dr. Mary Zupont, Neuroscience Institute, co-medical director and of the chief neurology strategy officer at Children's Hospital of Orange County, also known as Chalk, along with our moderator, Maureen MacArthur Hart. PhD Strategic Advisor at Global Genes. So let's give them a round of applause and we'll get started. Thank you so much everybody and we're very excited to talk with you a little bit about this very important topic. Uh, we've heard a lot about this, some even um, just this morning and some other sessions about the importance of being able to really try and communicate with clinicians about things that you are observing or things that, that you recognize as a problem within uh, your experience with your disease. And so um, each of the panelists here is going to start us off with a, a little bit of their um, their experience, and then we'll segue into a panel discussion and then follow it up with questions and answers. So we'll start with Caroline. Thank you, Maureen. My name is Caroline. Uh, I'm the founder and patient advocate of the San Diego Undiagnosed Family Support Group. Uh, I have a child. He is uh, 14 now, and we were on a 12-year diagnostic odyssey with him. He actually just last year, a year ago this month, got diagnosed with a, um, a newly discovered neurological disorder, uh, a mutation of the IRF2BPL uh, gene. And um, I'm going to share with you a little bit of my experience and what I think is important as far as communication and uh, share, you, uh, share his story with you also later in the, in the slides. So the challenges that we have um, is time, not only time to get the correct diagnosis, but also time to have with the, cl the clinicians. Um, they see 11 to 20 patients a day. They don't have enough time, and uh, scheduling time to see them also takes time for scheduling. So time is, I guess, one of the greatest challenges when communicating with uh, physicians. And so, like I said, the, the physicians see an average of 11 to 20 patients a day. Um, there's also lack of awareness. Uh, there's over 200 new diseases that are discovered every year, and there's not enough awareness about rare diseases among physicians. And so I think it's very important for us to be aware and um, not only advocate publicly, but also advocate within um, uh, the, the clinical setting when we're with the doctors and specialists, uh, because there's also difficulty with coordination with among cl clinicians themselves. Every everybody seems to be in their own little um, silo, and uh, they're not communicating with each other. So it's very important for us as as parents to uh, kind of um, uh, connect all that, them together and make sure they all communicate. And so there was a, a study um, released from Belgium uh, this year, uh, and um, there was a recommendation that uh, there needs to be more facilitation for effective teamwork amongst the diagnostic process in the healthcare um, scene, and not just, not just the healthcare professionals, but also the patients and also the families. Because, of course, the families and the parents are all 
the caregivers are the ones that have all the information, all the day in and day uh, information, uh, which is very crucial to physicians that are making decisions about what tests to do next or what treatments to try, what medications. So it's very important. So um, my, my suggestion is uh, to be an active participant, um, not just to be passive, and, uh, but to be active uh, and speak up. Speak up and ask a lot of questions um, and uh, prepare a written list. Like I said, we're, we are short on time when we have the 15, 20 minutes that we have with a physician, so preparing a list of questions and important symptoms, things that you wanna share with the physician. Uh, and pr prioritize so that when discussions do go in depth that you, you, you don't wanna miss the most important things on your list. Uh, share information, as I said, there's so many rare diseases, not every physician will know all 7,000 plus diseases. So if, if you suspect maybe there are a handful of uh, diseases that may be similar, uh, suggest them to your doctor and say, hey, I looked this up and maybe this is something that we should look into or get tested for. Uh, so share that information and also share information if you've had testing or have seen other physicians at other institutes uh, to have those clinicians share the information, like write a letter or a report or, or even call and, and talk to um, uh, your home, home physician. Uh, pull together the medical team. Um, you're seeing different specialties and, and pediatricians, but in all, they need to all talk together to, to really be uh, effective in, in care and also the diagnosis. Uh, trust, trust because there is, um, uh, you kind of have to, it, it's kind of a two-way street. You have to trust your physician, they have to trust you. Uh, so you have to build that trust with the physician to communicate. Um, and then. Lastly, be creative. Uh, there's a short, very short amount of time, um, so which leads me to the next slide, which is a video. I'm, um, I created a, my husband and I created a short two and a half minute video that describes what's going on with our son. Uh, and we've been sharing that with medical people, teachers, therapists, so that they can, in two and a half minutes, understand what we're going through and what the, his symptoms are. So I would like to, share them that video with you here. Uh -huh. Can I have that please? Make it. <laughs>
that's the video and um, just some information on the last pages, references, and um, two groups that I, that I run and support. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. And um, now we'll hear from Tiffany. Well, if that's not relatability, I don't know what is. <laughs> um, I have a slide show to, you know, a few slides just to kind of bring introduction into my world. Um, and after watching that, it's like, you know, focus on the positive, find the silver lining somewhere. Um, but the, the importance of, of communication, it, it's key. I'm a speech pathologist by trade. I worked in the school setting for about 25 years. All the while in that time frame, my son was diagnosed with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Unlike many of the stories I've heard, um, moms are searching for, for an answer, searching for this rare disease. Our rare disease came to us out of the blue. Um, Will was uh, having some gastrointestinal problems. We ended up at the gastroenterologist. They were ruling out Crohn's disease. Next thing you know, CK levels are 25,000. Next thing you know, we're at a pediatric neurologist and your son has Duchenne muscular dystrophy. What is that? Um, so it's so important to arm ourselves with the knowledge to communicate with everyone, doctors, clinicians, hospitals, friends, family. Um, so I'll just jump into my slide here. Um, Dr. Brenda Wong was our core. Um, at, we started seeing her, she's a neurologist now at UMass, um, but her belief was putting the child first. And when that happened, when Will became empowered with the condition, it, it drove us to, um, to be better able to manage it, to handle it, to cope with it. Um, our family has been a support mechanism too, you know, communicating with them um, and his teachers. So really the, the lines of communication among all stakeholders, um, it's just so important. Now, sometimes they're not gonna believe you, <laughs> you know, or gonna be on the same path that you're on, and that's okay, because we have stages of grief, and not everyone's gonna be at the same stage at the same time. I mean, and I know myself as mom, I've gone through all stages, maybe all of them in the same day, you know, just depending on what's going on in life. So it's just really important to know what my experiences are different from Caroline's experiences, yet there's pieces that we can connect together because we're both moms of beautiful children. And so, it, you know, just that communication is key. Um, this is kind of, uh, yeah, I'm, as I said, I'm a speech path by trade, so I kind of look at things and try to compartmentalize how can I help someone come up with a toolkit to kind of um, advocate for themselves. So I came up with this idea um, with parent, positive, advocate, relate, educate, navigate, and trust. Um, I, I really think we can move dialogue forward by using a positive tone to go in with optimism. Um, sometimes check yourself, you know, is that, is that mean mama bear coming out or is it the nice one, you know? Um, check, because you move mountains with sugar, right? Um, but be educated and just have that positive. Think about what, put your child first and think about how he wants to emulate you and is it gonna be that nasty, crazy, you know, get it done mom or is it the one who's passionate but educated and, and getting the buy-in from the other side. Um, always keep your child's best interest in mind. Is that conversation going two ways or is it just one way? And even if it's as mom and the clinician is not engaging you, find another clinician, it's okay. Like if you don't have that good relationship um, on both sides, it's okay. You, you have that right to go and find someone else. You have to have that relationship. It's so important, especially when you're dealing with something that not many people know about. Um, and then to relate, understand the various perspectives, as I, I mentioned previously. Um, the video, use of video, photos is so important. It, it says more than what I could ever say verbally. To show my son, to show Will, on a video, I mean, we, we totally got a glimpse into what you're going through because of that video. So use, utilize technology to our advantage. Um, and then educate, um, think before you speak. Again, you know, is that raging mama coming out or is it the one that has thought, 
her, and gotten her thoughts together and came out collectively that everyone is going to be on that same page. Uh, navigating, um, are your goals, goals manageable and realistic? Um, it's, it's, it's keep coming back to the now, living in the moment, um, just important. Um, and then trust. I, I really feel that following our instinct is key. Um, I know doctors have told me that too. Yeah, you know, there's times, I mean, I've met other moms who they knew something was wrong, get, a, get their child to the ER, and the doctors didn't know, but mom knew. Mom was right. Wow, you know, we might have, that instinct might really mean something. So, um, and then always sharing our story. I mean, Global Genes this weekend has been a week, whatever day it is, I've lost track of time. Um, but it's just been so invigorating and reminding me of, of being vulnerable, you know? It's hard, it's hard to constantly keep telling it, but it's so important. And if my story is gonna impact another person to share their story, and then the more we get it out, I just think it's just so important. Um, and I'm watching the clock down there. And, and just, yeah, the communication is key. Um, so this is in the middle of my, me and my daughter Emily, and my son Will, and then our, our wonderful Brenda Wong in the top, and, and our Kier Duchenne founder, Deborah Miller, and that's Deborah Miller's son, Hawken, in the bottom. So um, together we are family strong. That's kind of, it may not be blood family, but um, it's the family you make on the road. So um, I like to use that hashtag a lot, so. And then uh, there are flyers. Um, there's some on the tables as long as, long as um, the PDF is uploaded to the app. So feel free to share, utilize. Your turn. <laughs> Thank you so much. And yes, Mary. Okay. Let's see. Do I move it forward? Mm -hmm. Is that what I do? <laughs> there you go. Okay. So much of what I'm going to say is complementary and really ties in with what Caroline. And uh, uh, what Caroline and Tiffany have already said, at, um, and I'm fortunate enough. I'm a. I, I really believe. I, well, I finished my BSRN, my nursing degree, before I went on to become a physician. So I've been a, a physician for 40 years. So when I graduated from the University of Wisconsin, I had completed all my credits for nursing school, but I. Um, decided I, I, at that time, couldn't be a nurse. And, and part of it had to do with the fact that the physicians that I interacted with were, were not listening to me. They were uh, dismissive. Uh, most nurses at that time were women. And I said, well, I could be one angry nurse, or maybe I should just take a break and figure out what I need to do. And uh, uh, so I did. And nurses at that time were you were either in hospital or clinic nurses, there were no advanced practice nurses, nurse practitioners at that time. In fact, the University of Wisconsin was just starting their nurse practitioner program. So I did some work in genetics and decided that working with neurospora mold was not exactly what I was supposed to do. I, I really enjoy hearing stories, engaging with people, and I missed the bedside nursing that I had done. So I did apply to medical school, and I ended up going to medical school at, at UCLA in a class where there were 25 women. At that point, that was the largest class of women that UCLA had ever had, and this is a class of 150. So you can imagine what that was like. It was a different time, a different place. But my nursing, I guess my point is, my nursing background has really helped me as a clinician because nurses are at the bedside or with patients and they often listen to stories. And that's the point of this. We clinicians need your story. And creating a timeline of signs or symptoms, how things evolved, when did you first notice that something was different and what was it specifically? And then do you have videos? Because mm -hmm. I think videos are so important and now that we have, everybody has a cell phone, so they take videos, they really teach me a lot about how things have changed over time or what the exact signs or symptoms are. So I think videos are really, really helpful. In, as part of the, I'm part of the Child Neurology Foundation, 
And we have done an infantile spasm awareness network and created a mnemonic called STOP. So parents see the signs. They always know when something is not right. So that's the S. T is take a video. O is obtain a diagnosis and P is prompt treatment. And I think that's what everybody should use. Um, I'm fortunate enough as a child neurologist, uh, before I came um, to the University of California Irvine Chalk, I insisted that I would need at least an hour and with complicated patients at least two hours if I was going to do a good job. Because doing 15 minutes, you can hardly say hello to a family who is suffering, who, who has a child who may have an undiagnosed rare disease. How can you get through a timeline and understand the story in 15 to 20 minutes? That's absolutely impossible. And then you feel badly, we do, and the parent feels badly, and we haven't really helped that child. And so um, that was something that I insisted on, and I, I, I think it has served all of us in neurology, in, at chalk at least, in good stead. But I certainly want to hear the story. I want to listen. And, and it's important. Uh, clinicians are pushed for time. And that's not anything, trust me, that we like. Unfortunately, there is the quote unquote business side of medicine, which if I could do anything, I would change our whole healthcare system. It would not be fee for service. It would be a whole child model where we just get paid a salary and we take the time that it takes to listen to the story, do some critical thinking about what the possibilities are, and actually dialogue with, with parents and our respective uh, colleagues. And we do have multidisciplinary clinics, because you're right, medicine, because it's fee for services, all siloed, which makes me, as a, with my nursing background, absolutely crazy, because we put together nursing care plans. And any of you who are nurses or or have engaged with nurses know that they enjoy, and we put together timeline, we put together home health care plans that are comprehensive. It's not just about the patient, it's about the family, it's about the ethnicity, uh, their religious background, their fina financial background, educational background. You have to put all of that together because you can have the best medical plan in the world and if the family can't buy a medication, or don't have the means to get to certain appointments, then it's all for naught. So I like to listen to stories. And I may, after the story is told, or I may redirect if I have to, just to find out, uh, clarify what the timeline is. Is something progressive, or does the parent think it's, it's steady or maybe getting better? That's really helpful for me. Are the symptoms intermittent or continuous? That's also helpful. So, and yes, we are scientists. And neurologists are particularly nerdy. They like facts. Um, they make me crazy sometimes. <laughs> I consider myself more a pediatrician. Uh, but it is really helpful, as you alluded to, Caroline, to have the previous diagnostic tests. I have parents who come in who say, well, we just want to tell the story, and then we don't want you to know what previous tests have been done. Well, that's a void that really needs to be filled, because I don't want to repeat studies that have already been done um, I want to be able to move forward and, and progress. So having a written story or a timeline, um, knowing what the previous diagnostic tests were, um, and I just divided them up, uh, genetics, metabolic, neuro neuroimaging. There may be others, depending on what the particular child whom I'm seeing has, what condition he or she has. And then the previous medications, and what, what were, if, if there was a diagnosis, even if there isn't, what medications were tried and was it effective? Was it not effective? Did it make the condition worse? What were some of the side effects? Those kinds of things are very, very helpful for all of us to move forward. Um, and we ask a lot of questions. Fortunately, I do have the time to do that, to get a, a past medical history and a family history. Increasingly, because of the genetics, we know that it's, it's more than usually one simple gene. It can be a complex genetic interaction that can produce a neurologic condition or uh, a specific uh, disorder. But sometimes hearing the family history is really, really helpful. Uh, my specialty is epilepsy. So it's, uh, it's interesting because 
you can have a condition called benign melandic epilepsy, for example, which is if I have a child who has benign, I'm seeing a child who has benign melandic epilepsy, I'm actually very happy because they're going to outgrow that condition. But in their family history, there's often a family history of febrile seizures or what we, uh, childhood absence, what we used to call petty mal seizures. So it's, it's very helpful uh, in for information. And I think as our ability to diagnose uh, disorders through genetic testing, the family history is going to become increasingly important. And then clinical observation is critical. And I don't really, I can be watching a child in the examining room and interacting and throwing a ball and talking to them and really complete most of my neurologic exam and physical exam just by observation. Uh, my mentor, Dr. Ray Chun, who was at the University of Wisconsin, he was a really a kind child neurologist who taught me more about just listening to the story and watching, uh, watching children play during the exam. And so sometimes parents would complain, well, he never really examined my child. Well, he really did because we would be throwing balls, they'd be running down the, down the hallway, walking on, toe, on their toes, dancing, singing songs, he might play word games with them. Well, your neurologic exam is pretty much done by that time. So um, for a, a really good clinician will take a really detailed history or listen to the story and by observation and some neurologic assessment, be able to uh, put together what our initial impressions may be. If I don't know what's going on by the time you have told your story and listened to the history, I'm in trouble, typically. Uh, the neurologic exam or the physical exam is icing on the cake but the story, the history is the most important. And I tell all my medical students and residents that. I said, put away your iPhones and your iPads. I don't even want to see them on rounds. We're actually going to go talk to the family. Oh, and, a novel idea. and yeah, novel idea, <laughs> and examine the patient. Let's do that. And you will learn a lot. And that helps me with critical thinking and, and putting together my impressions. And then I'll ask the parents what they think. You know, what, what in your research, what do you think um, is going on? Or what questions do you have? Uh, and don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, we, we are, I'm, I would say, yes, I'm lucky because I have that time and I insisted on that time. And I think more physicians need to insist on that time. None of us like 15 to 20 minute visits because as you stated, Parents of children who have undiagnosed diseases that may be degenerative or neurologic diseases, they are going through stages of grief. And those stages could be denial. Well, it's Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, if you've ever read a book on death and dying. Denial, anger, bargaining, reconciliation. And no parent goes through it at the same time or at the same stages. And you revisit those yeah. stages Absolutely. often, right? Um, and so I end up being maybe not, I'm not just a physician, but I'm the counselor. I, uh, I, I embrace the whole child, whole family model. Um, so um, when you come, if, if you have difficulties communicating with your clinician, bring along another family member um, or, or an advocate, somebody you trust who can maybe help you. And a written list, I think, is absolutely correct. I mean, I'll go to the doctor and I'll say, oh, I forgot to ask that question. But if you write it down, you won't forget in the, in the heat of the moment, if you will. Um, so prepare a list of questions um, ahead of time with specific asks. Mm -hmm. um, that's good. And bring your own research to the clinic visit. I never mind that. I mean, I may not have the time to look at it right away, but I can after the, after the clinic visit. But I think that's perfectly appropriate because as you mentioned, there are so many new diseases, it's impossible for any of us to, uh, to keep up with all the new genetic disorders and disease, diseases. And with communicating with families, just to, to bring it around full circle, you've already said it. Uh, we need to listen, you need to tell the story. And um, 
write down the timeline. I think that's really good. Write down your questions. Don't be afraid to, to ask questions. I think some, some of my families aren't afraid to ask questions at all. <laughs> but others are more intimidated. They find that uh, physician uh, visit really, really difficult. Um, and that's why an advocate sometimes is, is good. And then find a clinician if you don't like the person that you are with and you can't establish that trusting relationship, then by all means get a second opinion or find a clinician where you can really engage in a, in a dialogue about additional studies and management strategies. Um, so that kind of brings it all full circle. Just as a, a caveat, it, you should know and you may not know that neurologists, pediatric neurologists, were trained, like I had three years of pediatrics, three years of neurology, two years of epilepsy. So I was like 35 before I started practicing. But pediatricians now are not trained in neurology. They're not. We are, the child neurologists are part of the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology. So we fall under that, a separate board. So we are not even recognized by the American Academy of Pediatrics as a pediatric subspecialty. So I was required to take um, neurology when I was a pediatric resident because that was so many years ago, 30 plus years ago. But now neurology is no longer a requirement for pediatricians, which to me is shocking because the research will tell you that 35% of what walks through a pediatrician's office is a neurological problem. Think about autism. That's a neurological disorder. It's not a psychiatric disorder. It's a neurological disorder, um, as is all uh, mental health-related issues. Schizo schizophrenia is a neurologic disorder, disorder. But then headaches, developmental delay, epilepsy, which uh, affects 1% of the population, generally presents itself in infancy or young childhood, and neuromuscular disease, that's, that's a large chunk of the population. And there are only um, uh, 1,800 child neurologists in this country. Most of us, over 50% of us, are over 50 years of age. And we are not training enough neurologists to replace those of us who at some point in our lives will <laughs> go into re retirement. But uh, that, that presents a conundrum. And it all falls back, if you ask me, back onto reimbursement and our healthcare system. So one of my goals, and uh, Christy Greasy sitting right there can attest to that, is to change the healthcare system and make it more accessible to families and change our, how our, we are paid as physicians, get rid of the fee for service, and look more at population health, whole child model, and take care of the patients who need to be taken care of without having to worry about getting paid. We just, the fee-for-service should just go and we should look more at uh, wellness and having a salary. And that would solve a lot. So that's a simple answer for a difficult problem, right? <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you all so very much. Um, really appreciate you sharing your stories. And we're going to do just a couple of questions here and then open it up um, yeah. broadly for any questions from the audience. I, I did want to ask um, one question. We've talked a lot about um, sharing stories and, and not being afraid to ask. Um, but I, w I was wondering, I, I know you had uh, didn't have a diagnosis for so many years and there are a lot of even newer diagnostic tests, and yet we're, a lot of people are running up against physicians who aren't necessarily able to track all of the, the rare diseases available and might want to just get a diagnosis and then continue on. Do you have any advice for people who are um, trying to ask for some diagnostic steps? Uh, you know, to either get that diagnosis or perhaps to, to further refine their diagnosis and are perhaps running into some um, challenges in communicating to their clinicians about the need for those diagnostic tests. How do you ask for, for, for a diagnostic test? For, 
for our case, we kind of followed what the doctors had suggested with some minor research I've done on my own. Oh, it could be these symptoms seem to fit these diseases. I throw out, oh, you know, it could be Neiman picks or maybe it's this, and um, and then the doctor will say, okay, well, we have a test for that. <laughs> maybe we should try it. It seems like the symptoms match. So um, I think knowing what your child's symptoms are and specifying it very clearly and if there happens to be a disease that you think it may be suggesting it, because uh, I don't know what all the diagnostic tests are, but the physician would know. So um, I make sure you make the symptoms very clear. Anybody else? Well, for um, there, it's kind of two pronged. Like the, the the in my field of epilepsy, we can do an infantile epileptic encephalopathy panel of 368 plus genes, which is still a small subset of probably all the genetic conditions mm -hmm. that can produce epilepsy, i.e. recurrent seizures in infancy. But it, it really is cost effective, if you will, to do that. I always ask my residents, what are your top five? <laughs> what do you think is going to be positive? So that they still do the critical thinking that's required to think about what the diagnostic possibilities are. But those are always changing. So there's an infantile epileptic encephalopathy panel and then a childhood epileptic encephalopathy panel that combine a lot of genes. There's a gen uh, genetic testing panel now for sensory, progressive sensory neuropathies for leukodystrophies, which is white matter diseases. So, and it's hard for physicians to keep up with all the different panels. So that's one part of the issue. The second part is insurance companies. Mm -hmm. They will go out of their way to prevent you and to prevent the physician from ordering it without socking the parents or the families for out-of-pocket uh, costs. And if insurance companies work for us instead of working for their investors, like for-profit insurance companies, that's unethical, that's immoral, that should be done. We cannot allow that in our country, to have insurance companies dictate what tests a physician can order. Now, I'm mama bear with my, <laughs> with my patients, so I will get on the phone and I'll insist on talking to the medical director and push them on saying, I'm sorry, this test needs to be done for X, Y, or Z uh, reason. <laughs> you know? well, so I medical directors now know my first name. <laughs> oh, it's you again. <laughs> well, and I think to go back on how do you ask for that test, it's to have this in your backyard, in yeah. your pocket. You I mean, have to have it because when I, that's because like for us with for Will, I mean, as soon, once I connected with Brenda Wong, who was in my, you know, she get it. She heard my story. She listened and she was going to do whatever it took to get what yeah. Will needed. And it's all that relationship building. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I, I want to take an opportunity. Does anybody have a question from the audience? Oh, we also have. Um, <laughs> We have an online question, too. Oh, okay. oh, good. Hi, thank you so much for speaking with us. I'm a medical student, um, so I'm trying to better understand like the patient perspective as well. And I was wondering, I know some providers will give handouts to patients, like mm -hmm. fill this out before the encounter. This is the information that I'll need for your next visit. Do you find that helpful as a patient or a family member? Or do you find it like another thing to do, overwhelming? Are you asking any of us? <laughs> um, it depends on what it's asking. Uh, you know, I mean, I certainly like to provide. If, if I see that it's going to be used on the other side, there's been times where I've completed information in advance, and then I get to the appointment, and they never even reference it. <laughs> so that's, yeah, that's where the frustration <laughs> lies. If it's actually utilized, I certainly don't mind providing it. I'm, I'm excited to hear or to see that they're asking for that information, but it better be utilized. <laughs> yeah, right. If you're going to take the time. Yes, because it. Yeah, because I, I, and I know other moms, you know, who who will pour their heart and soul into that information and really provide updated, accurate information, and then it's never utilized, and it's like, why did I do all of that? So, if it's going to be used, absolutely, I, I see it as a great tool. Thank you. Yeah, I would, I would echo that. That uh, having forms filled out ahead of time, I can often follow the form and ask for clarification if I don't understand something, but it's, it saves a lot of time. And um, 
I don't typically ask for the story, but the past medical history, the family history, um, other, have there been any hospitalizations, surgeries, injuries, allergies, past medication trials, if that's filled out, that's really helpful. And then one more quick question. Um, how hard was it to actually get like an hour to two hours for patient visits in academic medicine? Oh, well, <laughs> they were desperate. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Chalk Children's Hospital of Orange County didn't really have much of a neurology department before I came. And I was very well established uh, at the University. Of, first, I was at the University of Wisconsin, then at the Mayo Clinic and Columbia University. And then we went back to Wisconsin because my mother was sick. Uh, so for them, for me to come to California wasn't going to be easy, uh, basically, other than the weather. I would say the weather is a big positive. But, the, but I just said, you know, you can bill extra time for patients. But to me, it, was a fruit, it would have been so frustrating and a fruitless endeavor to think that uh, having less than that amount of time would result in anything productive. It would be frustrating for the families, for the patients, and for the clinician. So they, they bought that. Um, and you know you can bill for two hours of time, and you just document. I hate documenting, but mm -hmm. you have to document every single minute of time that you, that you spend. But it was a struggle, I will tell you that. Here's an online question, and then we have one right here. Um, and they're for Dr. Soupont. How do you get your doctors to all talk to each other when there are multiple issues? And then let me just, um, regarding the time, there was a follow-up. Can we push for good interview skills in medical education? Mm. Are those both for me? Yes. No. Oh, OK. Well. There is more medical interviewing going on in medical schools now, uh, where they actually do uh, taping sessions, where um, uh, they'll have either um, uh, actual patients and families come in, and, and you'll conduct a mock interview in history, and then you will videotape it and then replay it and say what went well here, what didn't go well. So th I think that is being increasingly built into the curriculum, which is really good. Very, very important. Uh, I did that in nursing school 45 years ago, so it's about time. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, that's how you build it. And, some, and, and we really should, this is complicated, but um, to get into medical school, you have to have really good math and science skills. Those qualities, those analytical skills, don't necessarily translate into high emotional intelligence, <laughs> OK? And in addition, it's very competitive. So you, you're in a competitive, analytical, mathematical science environment, and then you're supposed to sit down and have a conversation right. with the family. That's an entirely different skill set. So I think the way we choose medical students needs to be refined. So that's one part of the question. What was the first question again? <laughs> the, and the other one was, you know, how do you get multiple doctors oh, to yes. speak with each other when there are complex issues? Um, we do have multidisciplinary clinics, like for, uh, we have a MDA clinic, Muscular right. Dystrophy Association Clinic, that encompasses a lot of neuromuscular diseases. Uh, my epilepsy clinic, our ep comprehensive epilepsy clinic, you have to get a grant for this, but we have pharmacists, dietitians, psychologists, social worker, that's the most important, and nurses working together in a clinic. We also have a tuberous sclerosis complex clinic where we have nephrologists, cardiologists, neurologists, neurosurgeons all working together. So that's one way to do it. Often, you now through the state of California, you can get credit, if you will, because we work on, we have to get RVU credit, relative value units. You will, that's how we are uh, assessed and how we are paid by relative value units, which I won't even go there because it's worthless. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, there are ways that we can get paid by putting together a multidisciplinary clinic, either through the state as a, a center of excellence, or you get a grant. Otherwise, 
you, I'll, I'll just make phone calls. A good example was a patient of mine who is having abdominal pain and has epilepsy. And it's very clear to me that there's a lot of anxiety and depression that's going on. Well, the GI doctor told her to discontinue the felbamate. Well, that first of all, he did so without talking to me. So then the mother calls and says, well, I'm going to discontinue this medicine. Well, if you discontinue an anti-epileptic medication right away, you're going to go into status epileptic. So that's prolonged seizures. So, that's a, so I called him up and said, that, this cannot stand, and we have to have better communication. So oftentimes, I will call physicians directly. And then the third way you get coordination is to have, and, and I think increasingly in California, we are going to have nurse navigators who can coordinate appointments among the different subspecialists and actually put together a letter that is, uh, incorporates all the information from the different subspecialists. But the siloed nature that, by which medicine has worked in the past just can't stand. And with the whole child model in California, the, the payment is going to move from fee to service to having a certain population like chalk has a certain population and that it, where it's capitated. That means we get paid a certain amount, which means it is in our best interest and the family's best interest to keep these children healthy and out of the hospital. And I think that's where you're going to see medicine go next, is getting rid of fee-for-service and looking at a well-child, well-family model where it pays to keep somebody out of the hospital and to communicate together so that they, there aren't unscheduled emergency room visits, unscheduled hospitalizations. Hi, this is for the doctor. You sound amazing. Um, so my son and I have a neuromuscular um, disease. And at all the doctor's appointments, we have kind of the fellows come in, ask the questions, hear the story. You've had that. Why, why is that? And does that information get to you? Sometimes I feel like I have to repeat myself to the fellow and then the doctor. So I just wanted to know, is that, what do you do in that case and, and why? Well, usually with neuromuscular diseases, same with epilepsy, if you're in an academic institution, you're training the next generation of doctors. Mm -hmm. And yes, it's probably painful for you all to do that because you are end up telling your story twice. And the reason you end up telling the story twice is the healthcare provider, typically the physician, wants to make sure that the fellow has conveyed that information accurately and may also want additional clarification. But there isn't a patient that I see where a medical student or a resident sees the patient and then sends them on their merry way without me laying eyes on them and, and doing a, a, a follow-up history and a physical exam. But it's because we're a teaching institution. If you don't teach the future generation of physicians, they're never going to learn. Um, and that's the positive and the negative. Yeah. It gives you the chance to refine your story. So in the, you know, <laughs> that's right. Well, it's a, yeah, by the time you get in, man, this story is perfect. <laughs> but it does take time. I we have a couple it. more questions from the audience. Hi, I I'll probably have a lot of questions for the doctor. I was wondering if you're going to be here later. Um, but I, or I, I, one of my biggest questions is, so I have Moya Moya disease and I have a long list of like couple pages of other diseases that are kind of rare and then a long list of like undiagnosed stuff and even through the undiagnosed disease network they couldn't they haven't been able to diagnose, and so I just kind of been put on the back burner. But um, my biggest question is, I was adopted. I was adopted from South Korea, and the question about family medical history, that is like the most challenging question. So I want to mm -hmm. like ask this question representing my fellow adoptee community. Like how can we, how, what is the best way we can like answer that question when we have no medical history? And how can we like interact with doctors in a way because some people get really defensive or angry, and I want to be able to encourage others and even encourage doctors to be like more patient with people who were adopted because we don't have a medical history. You may be able to answer some of that. I mean, if you don't have the history, you don't have the history. That, I mean, I, have, I see plenty of 
uh, adopted children or children who are in foster care and we don't have a good history. That's just going to be one part of the, of the history that's going to be missing. Um, it may be that the physicians that you've interacted with, um, I don't know if, I can, I, I'm not there so I can't speak to it, but sometimes they may be frustrated by that and that comes out, uh, comes off as being irritated, but it's not really toward you, it's just darn, I don't have that portion of the, mm -hmm. of the history. But if you don't have it, you don't have it. Right. Can't manufacture it. I was wanting to address the comment you made about wanting to reward doctors for not putting people in hospitals. Oh. <laughs> now that to me is very scary because we it, have a health you know, HMO and they don't want to put kids or patients in hospitals because, or even go to specialists because that puts more money out of right. their pockets for the HMO. So I see that as this huge red flag when that statement mm -hmm. is made. I don't know if I'm probably others have had to deal with advocating my, my, my child needs this test, my child has to have this, mm -hmm. and, and the operation. How, how would you, I mean, well, how I, would you address I, that? I, I think um, you perhaps misinterpreted what I was, uh, what I, I absolutely hear what you're saying because I've dealt with HMOs uh, and the, they will try to stonewall an ad admission. I get that. Um, what I'm talking about is that that's where the slippery slope is. You have to look at how can we keep a certain population well so that they don't have to go into the hospital or have to uh, go to an emergency room. My, th this, if this was an easy answer on how to contain health care costs, I'd get a pro uh, probably a uh, health care Nobel Prize for that. Mm -hmm. It's a complicated equation. But what I will say is that most of us as, as physicians and healthcare, other healthcare providers want to keep our, our children, the healthy. children that we take care of healthy. But if they're sick, we will advocate for them and get them in the hospital. And you know, the same goes for medication. To me, this is a simple answer to a very complex problem. You have to take the for-profit out of it for the healthcare industry. I that, agree. Ha that has to go away. And you can talk about universal health care. There are pluses and minuses to that, but I happen to be a big advocate for it because I've seen it work in the Canadian system and I've seen it work in the European health care system. But, but there will be a prioritization, if you will, of problems and who gets seen first in that system. And then you can complement it with a private uh, insurance. But, you have to, I think one of the first steps we could take in this country is to remove the for-profit aspect of health care. And how to get there is a, a more complex issue because we have a very strong health care lobbying going on in Congress. Thank you. We have time, Morgan, we'll for give, yes. another question? Yeah. I guess this question is more for the caregivers. I was recently oh, uh, diagnosed uh, with a rare disease, and I'm in a situation of where my current nephrologist doesn't really want to listen to me, um, whether it's you know for a specific type of testing or whatnot. And I don't want to feel like I need to always like switch to a new doctor mm. every time I feel like I'm not being listened to. Are there strategies to kind of getting your doctor to really like listen to you. Um, I've, I've done the email, like I'm like, here's a contact information for the Mayo Clinic that's doing research on my disease. You know, I found like a, a pharmaceutical company that's doing free genetic testing for my disease, will you do it? And he's like, no. And then hmm. they end up using the genetic center at the UC uses that same service that I had showed him two months earlier. And so I'm getting to a point of where I'm super frustrated, but I don't necessarily want to bounce from doctor to doctor all the time just because I get frustrated. You might be able to answer to that a little bit. Well, um, I'd say change the doctor. Yeah, well. <laughs> yeah. I if, actually if, am in this situation. Uh -huh. I'm kind of hoping in the future if this comes up, that there's ways to kind of navigate this. Um, so don't 
I mean, almost interview, you know, interview mm -hmm. the, the doctors, the other, look at, you know, don't just jump from this one to another one, schedule That's an interview. Idea. I mean, why, why can't we interview the doctor to see if there's a relationship? Because if he's, it's like, what's the definition of insanity? You know, doing the same thing over, expecting no. different results. I mean, you know, so, I mean, to me, I, I, I know at the beginning of Will's diagnosis, there was a debate whether it's Becker or Duchenne, Becker or Duchenne, and I went to the neurologist and she said Becker. Well, then I go to the next one, they did say Duchenne, and it's like, okay, well, I, either of, neither of you know the answer, so I have to keep finding, keep going. And if you have to mm -hmm. bounce, you have to bounce. You know, I mean, I don't know. The only way to move it to a, a place where you're comfortable is when you have that two-way conversation. The dialogue. Yes, you have to have that rapport. You have to have that, that person that's willing to listen to your story and give you that time. Look in your eye and not just instantly say no. Right. All right. And it does take time yeah. to go and make an appointment and, and meet a doctor yeah. and if it doesn't work out. But yes, it is frustrating. But um, you really have to find that rapport and that trust, not th that you can trust the doctor and they'll listen to you. If they don't listen to you, um, it's kind of like hitting against right. a well, And like Mary said too, would it be a, a place where you could bring an advocate? Is there another family member yeah, or someone that can speak with you? Because sometimes coming in pairs, mm -hmm. gives, it, it removes you from that, you're in that mama bear moment for yourself, you know? And so that other person may offset some of it and may give a different perspective too. That's another suggestion. I think that's a, that's a good idea. You know, I've always, you know, typically my mom comes with us, so it's the two of us, and then we oh, take notes with each, for each other, and, you know, so that's just another idea. Because one person will hear, yeah. you know, um, t t having an advocate or a family member come, they'll hear something that you, you didn't hear. hear. Right. And also having two, individuals talk a new face talking yeah. to the physician may really make a, a difference <laughs> oh that's good because really if you what you remember from a physician's office this is, was a pediatric study done a number of years ago and these are well ch child checks 17 percent is what families remember so yeah. think of it if it's a much more highly charged stressful situation exactly. it's going to be a lot less and, and do you have any support groups that you could That's contact and mm -hmm. ask other people, hey, have you, is there a neurologist that you really like, or um, to ask other, other patients and other families for... Um, That's a good idea. Yeah. That's how we found a, a few of our good doctors. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Carol, Tiffany, and Mary so much for sharing your experience uh, and knowledge on this very, very important topic. So this concludes our uh, final breakout session for our 2019 Rare Patient Advocacy Summit. We have a very quick 15-minute break, and we're going to take down the air walls and then come back into this main ballroom for our closing session. We'd like to remind everyone that as we make this transition, please, if you have any questions for the speakers or if you want to speak to somebody else, please go out into the hallway so that we can uh, transform the ballroom into seating for everybody. Um, and also, please check out our remaining resources outside the room. I want to thank you all for joining us in this last session. And we hope that you learned an, a, a lot. And at this time, please also, we do need your feedback. So please take a moment to take a quick survey on the mobile app about this session. Thank you again.